Hello, 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 everyone. Thanks for tuning into today's episode. I have an incredible guest on. You may know him by his Instagram handle, Create the Love. I know many, many women, all of my friends, clients, advocates, we all know who you are. <laughs> we share your we share your post all the time, but he is a beautiful human and he is a human connection expert. So I would love to welcome to the show, Mr. Mark Groves. Mm, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for your continued eternal support. You've always been such a big supporter and I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just, it will, whenever I need to see the message, it's always the right message that pops up. <laughs> like he's nailing it every time. <laughs> Funny how that works, isn't it? It's like, uh, you know, when they, uh, it's like when someone feels called to write something, it happens to be that something that someone else needs to read. And I really do believe in just like I experience the same thing you do, you know, where I like need to hear something or learn something or have something put in a, per in a into perspective or whatever it might be, make something make sense. Mm -hmm. And so I never really ignore the calls of like, you need to write about this or you need to say this. Yeah. Um, even though sometimes it gets you in a little bit of, steam or hot water you know yeah it's all right <laughs> right it's all you, part of it exactly when you feel called to say something and it's just from the deep deep within your soul i think you know that's just you speaking authentically and those who it's going to resonate with it's going to resonate with you know right so i appreciate that and yeah i um for those listening, I had the pleasure of actually going through one of Mark's courses last year. Um, his uh, was it becoming a boundaries badass? I yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, and I really needed that uh, because I was going through a relationship that I was not honoring my boundaries. Um, and I mean, past relationships, I was not honoring boundaries either. So that was definitely something I needed the guidance in, and just really truly understanding where the lack of boundaries was coming from lack of self-love, lack of self-worth, deep rooted stories with family and, and all of that too. So it was a really, really profound course that I went through. So suggest anyone and everyone to go through it, whether you think you're good in your boundaries or not. <laughs> it was awesome. But um, yeah, so I want to ask you, you know, share your story with us. Um, you know, I, I love asking people kind of like where, where they came from, like how did they turn, you know, challenge to triumph, darkness to light. And I would love to know what that darkness to light looked like for you. Mm, it feels like an ongoing evolution, you know, where you experience another heavy hit and then you sort of expand with that and write about that or think about that. And I think that's true for everyone. We just have different creative outlets and, and maybe, you know, it, maybe it isn't true for us till we get hit with something hard enough that makes us stop and pay attention. And it really took me that, you know, mine was a relationship ending when I was 27. I had lots of hard hits before that. You spoke about boundaries. And I mean, I experienced a couple pretty giant betrayals in my early 20s, uh, which were all due to just not having boundaries. You know, I got into situations that if I looked back, uh, although I was being externally, I was being betrayed by someone else. Uh, if I connected the dots, I had betrayed myself earlier. And it's, I just got to the places that you get to when you don't listen, when you don't pay attention. And I could be stuck and blame the circumstances, or I could look, which I certainly did for a while, uh, from like probably 21 to 27, where I just didn't even look at any of those things. I just considered that sometimes people are liars and sometimes people cheat and it's on them. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really take any level of responsibility. I sort of trusted in this idea of fate, not recognizing that, you know, fate doesn't really work for you if you don't work for you, you know, and, and we'll call these continued experiences, these continued outcomes that um, not realizing that we are an active participant. And, and I say all that with, with, you know, obviously adding, the acknowledgement and the caveat that that's, you know, um, not to invalidate people's experience or to actually when they are a victim and they experience trauma or uh, whatever it might be or abuse, but, but to be able to hold the complexity of that, the pain of that, and, you know, and, and really look at how did I get here? And, um, you know, when you, 
obviously we're not in choice in some experiences. Life actually does happen to us. Um, but can we take a look at what has happened? And, and we certainly can't change what has happened, but we can change how we integrate it. We can change how we relate to it. And, you know, I, uh, the, the idea of like, you turn your mess into your message, you know, you take what's, which is what you're doing too. You know, you take what you've been through and you walk a path. And ultimately I realized that I wanted to become the teacher I needed. And, and so that's just been conceptually and perpetually the exact same thing I go through all the time, which is I learn something, I express what I learned so that people are learning in real time with me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a chat, I'm a page ahead of some people and I'm chapters and books behind others. And I think it's really a, an opportunity for us to see ourselves within the experiences of other people so that we don't feel so alone. We don't feel so isolated. We don't feel like I'm the only one when the reality is, is if we weren't all pretending to be perfect, we'd see that none of us are the only one. We're all actually going through the exact same or very similar collective experiences of rejection, of hurt, of trauma. Um, and, and the real work is to stop and say, how did I get here? And, and what can I do about it? And how do I create a future I actually want? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love that you said too about, you know, teaching people as you go too. I mean, I feel like I, I'm the same way, you know, I, I, sometimes I haven't even like embodied the teaching yet, you know, and I'm just like, yeah, for lack of a better word, regurgitating sometimes, but I'm like, this just impacted me so much. I got to like share this with the world. <laughs> so, yeah, I love I know you mean. But it's nice to be a student, you know, we're, we're always going to be uh, students. We're always here to learn, um, which I think that that's the most profound thing. And if you can situate yourself with people that do know more than you, then you're, you are constantly challenging your own behaviors and your own thoughts and, and that kind of thing. So. Yeah, I remember listening to um, Kelly Carlin. I think that's, yeah, I believe that's right. George Carlin's daughter. I was talking to her once. I just had the pleasure of being in a same room as her. And I asked her, how did she find her voice? Because she had just gotten a contract to write a book. This is probably like nine years ago. And she said to me, I found my, vo- I found my voice by using it. And I'll never forget that because at the time I didn't really know like, what's my thing? What's my statement? What's my, and you know, I've realized that that changes over time, just like your identity does and what you believe changes if you allow it to, otherwise you'll stay stuck in the static desire to want to protect who you were and not allow who you are to come forward. And, you know, I think a lot of the times you said um, uh, that, that sometimes we share the lesson before we've learned it and, I think that's actually a beautiful thing because I think sometimes you learn out loud, you know, you like through the share, you're like, Oh my gosh. Or someone reflects something. I've been through that too. Here's how I got through it. And you're like, Oh, those are the dots. And you just realize how much um, healing is so much better when you're sort of living open hearted. Uh, But you also have to remember that when you live open hearted, uh, you catch everything and and, and I mean, that's the truth about love is that if you love someone, you are at the exact same time going to experience what it's like to lose them. And so some of us fear that edge so much because we don't realize that there's sort of beauty in that. But we also don't realize that if we've been lost in love or lost ourselves, um, there's this idea that it's going to happen again as if we don't have a choice. You know, I think this is a common thing I hear from people like, that's chemistry. I don't have a choice. I'm just, who do I help who I'm attracted to? Or like, I just follow those. And I always think like, it, you, you don't have to pursue a relationship just because your loins tingle. You know, you can pursue a relationship because they embody the values you have. They, uh, ideally, you embody those values too, if you're pursuing them. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I mean, with all of my past relationships, like I said, I wasn't necessarily always in my power and, and in boundaries. And it was not until this like last relationship that I went, that I was, you know, going through that 
I was having like a different mindset about things. I mean, you know, in the past, if I was dating someone and they weren't truly showing up for me, I would elaborate, you know, bad mouthing them to friends, family, you know, and then they all get the bad taste in their mouth for the person. And then you're like, oh crap, well, I didn't want, I didn't mean for you to like, you know, now you, now you hate my boyfriend. (laughs) Right. You know, but (laughs) what happened with the last guy, um, I started, you know, if I did share anything, it was more me saying first, like prefacing the conversation, like, I know that I'm allowing this to happen, but this is what happened. <laughs> so right. like, don't get mad at him. Like, get mad at me, if anything. I'm just, I just need to vent. I need to like, to, like say it out loud though, you know? And so it was, it, it um, I guess it lessened the blow on him, but it helped me to truly understand and like bring awareness to Kelly. Why do you keep doing this to yourself? Mm-hmm. Like, okay, why, why do you keep staying in this situation if it's not getting any better? So it was helping me to bring awareness versus me just like projecting the crap on to my friends all the time about the guy that I was dating. It was like, so interesting. Yeah, I was just thinking as you were saying that, I was like, well, I wonder what that is, you know, when we, because uh, I think we're all familiar with that, complaining about the connection to someone else rather than uh, maybe we are, we're actually literally not safe to share within the connection, or maybe we're, we haven't cultivated an, uh, you know, I think abuse always needs to be put in this place of like, if, if there's any abuse, there's, the work is not to try to create a safe space. It's like, get yourself to a safe space. Mm Because often the people who end up in abusive relationships believe there's something wrong with them. And so if they just did enough work, they could change that thing or that person. Uh, No, you have to cultivate and get to know safety within yourself. And it's pretty hard to do that in those environments. And so I always like to give that caveat because it's an important one. The other side of that is you think like, okay, well, let's assume our partner can hold the truth. Um, If we never tell it to them, they'll never be invited to. So by withholding truth, we're saying, I don't trust you that you can hold this thing. But because I can't actually hold on to all of this energy, Um, and the relationship container can't hold it either. I'll go to other relationships and dispel it. I'll I'll spill it out uh, in other places. Um, And which is really, I think, a normal uh, human experience in that because we haven't been socialized or or been taught, how do you actually turn towards your partner? And if you're the partner, because we've all been the partner who gets the feedback, how do I actually... uh, stay turned towards you hearing that maybe my inadequacies are hurting you. And I think about this from a male perspective, but this doesn't have to be gendered. I just think it's more gendered is that in some way we equate our worth with, with that. So if, if a partner says to us, um, you're not showing up emotionally or you never want to talk, uh, we don't have capacity to hold very much shame. And this could be true for any human. Uh, again, I don't want to say it's only men. It's true of all humans. But I think it's just more so of like, when my partner says I'm a bad communicator, I have to face the possibility that I'm inadequate. And I think when we can't hold, when we can't hold our inadequacies within ourselves, which means we just haven't gotten to know them, we haven't gotten to the truth of who we actually are and how we actually show up and done an accurate audit on our lives, we miss out on the real wisdom that lives in our inadequacies. And gosh, I say that having dodged inadequacies like a machine, you know, <laughs> like whack-a-mole with my inadequacies. So I don't say that from a place of judgment, but rather a place of observation of like, wow, once I got to know the things I didn't love about me, wow, then I could all of a sudden sit with the things that you don't love about me yeah. because I already got to know them or, or I see that, when you give me feedback as my partner, as my friend, as my parent, as my child, um, that you're actually inviting me to be a better person, to grow. And, you know, I don't think we actually see partnership that way very often, you know? Yeah, yeah. How would you navigate that? Okay, say, um, say I'm in a relationship. And I'm telling, I am having that conversation with the guy that I'm dating. Like, you know, you're just, you're not showing up for me the way that I would like for you to be. And he recognizes that. He knows. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate that? Like to, uh, like, I mean, you can't make them think some way or act a certain way, but how, how do you make them feel safe that they aren't going to be like, well, I'm just not good enough for her. 
I can't give her what she needs. So I'm just going to back away. I think whenever I hear someone say, I just can't live up to your expectations, right? Like that's a common line from, from certain people. <clears throat> I can't live up to your expectations. I just feel like nothing will ever be enough for you. I feel like often the person who they're saying that to probably learned in some place that the way to connect was to criticize. And so it's like constantly this criticism um, and maybe they observe that from their parents. And so the way that they know how to create a bid or in the Gottman's words, that's what they call a bid is like a bid can be something simple. Like I'm reading something on my phone and I go, huh, my partner does this when she's reading something, she'll go, huh. And I'm like, Oh, what is it that you're reading? Right. Cause I know what she's doing unconsciously or consciously, but it's definitely in that case unconscious is she's saying there's something here that I'm really interested in. Can you be curious about my world? Mm -hmm. And so really successful couples turn towards about, I think it's about 80, 70, 80% of the bids really couples that end up divorced turn towards only about 30%, even less. And so we're constantly making bids, but if we learn that a bid is you didn't take out the garbage, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, why are you always doing this? So especially statements that start with you. You always, you never, anything that starts with you will instantly trigger unworthiness and defensiveness and stonewalling in someone who's likely conditioned to having a parent who was overtly critical, right? This is just the way we match relationally. Yeah. Someone who has a parent who's used to being criticized all the time is in a relationship with someone who criticizes all the time because both people are being invited to heal their shit. Yeah. And so first I would say it's always so important that we get in charge of our own language first. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and wherever there's a criticism, there's actually a desired behavior. So if I say like, you don't do this, what I'm really saying is I love it when you and imagine if we started making statements like that and we started rewarding positive behavior. Also, I mean, we experienced this in our relationship and I'm totally free to share this, so it's nothing. I'm not violating any uh, contracts here, which is my partner would be like, I would like this. And then I'd provide that thing and then she'd want something else. And I'm like, I feel like I'm playing whack-a-mole with your desires and it, it feels like you're never going to let me win. Like never let me get to the place where you're satiated and you're like, Oh, thank you. And, and she said, you know, that's so interesting because I observed that in, in my own experience growing up. And so uh, she said to me, what's really interesting about that is like, it's almost like I'm afraid at, at some point, that's how it keep you hustling. Like that's how I keep you vying for me as opposed to just us being and the rest is sort of gravy, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think when we can look at our patterns, if that's what we've done, it's like jump through the soup, prove you love me, jump through the soup, prove you love me, as opposed to you love me, that's known. You don't have to prove it because the, usually the people on the other side of I can never do enough is literally they can't. Because if they were enough and it was enough, and this doesn't mean you can't have normal, healthy uh, needs and criticisms of the way your partner's showing up. That's not saying that. It's saying, can you just surrender and rest in just allowing yourself to be loved? And if you could take responsibility for your language, then you now know that you've got your poop in a group. And now you're able to separate what is yours from what is mine. So I know that I've got my language dialed. I know that I'm beginning to monitor how I respond and react. I'm choosing different ways of doing that. I'm creating more safety. I'm not leading with criticisms. I'm changing to now do more positive uh, interactions. And still this person doesn't want to change. You know, I, I think the other part of that, which is if you're asking someone to change, to change a non-negotiable. So some non-negotiable might be um, uh, alcohol abuse, right? Something like that. But you can have any non-negotiable that belongs to you. I'm just giving an example of a common one. If you're not willing to do something about that, I have to have a consequence. And as you know, we explore in the boundaries course, if you don't have a consequence that you're willing to actually impart, your boundaries are just suggestions. They don't actually really mean much. Because if I say, here, I love you, 
and I really care about us. And it's important to me that this is a safe space for both of us. What I really need, I notice that alcohol is da 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 da. Here's the ways I'm willing to support you. Here's what I'm willing to tolerate. And here's what I need from you. And you can hear how they receive that. Now, you know, just because someone doesn't like your boundary doesn't mean the boundary is not a good boundary. Mm-hmm. You know, often people won't like boundaries, but they're allowed to have an experience of a boundary. And, and then you could say, if you don't do those things, here's the consequence. And, you know, if people don't actually do the thing, like, hey, we should go to therapy. I need you to book a session. Um, and they never do. Mm-hmm. Well, it's time to step up the communication and create a consequence because people live in this space of ambivalence and limbo their whole lives. Yeah. Nothing ever changes. And then they complain that nothing ever changes, but they haven't changed either. They're still in the same space. They're just not the one being criticized and the one being sought to change. But we participate in all dances. And as my friend Traver Bohm says, we're 100% responsible for our 50%. And um, sometimes that means saying, well, I'm used to tolerating bullshit and I'm used to letting someone just get away with it. I'm used to listening to someone say, I'm going to change. It never does. Mm -hmm. Well, it appears that my pattern changing would be finally choosing myself. Oh, and then you stop ending up in those situations because big macro self abandonments, like in relationship like that, usually follow very micro ones in the very early part of the dating process. Like, Ooh, this doesn't feel aligned. Ah, you know what, people tell me I'm too picky. And so, you know, or that was a bit of a red flag that communication was inconsistent. Uh, But you know what, they're just people and everyone's stressed right now. So we're like self-abandoning. So little self-abandonments lead to big self-abandonments. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? I was definitely involved in that (laughs) for a long time. Me too, me too. (laughs) Yeah. But I think that, I mean, like I said, I, I think just truly communicating with myself, bringing more awareness to those red flags or like when I did want to convey, you know, vent sessions to my girlfriends, I was like, Kelly, just have the vent session with yourself first. Like, let's stay up here <laughs> and figure this out. So you may not even have to project. Like, it's nice to have girl talk, but we don't need to like, you know, trash the dude either. So because he was a good, he's a good guy. Um, okay. So I want to ask you too, um, I know we've talked about this before, but how were you, I want you to kind of take me into like your life, how you were raised um, and how you feel like that affected your twenties. Great question. Um, (laughs) So my mom is an immigrant from Ireland. Um, She moved to Canada and she was traveling actually. And my dad, He was married before my mom. He got divorced. Uh, He had a daughter with his first wife. Um, My uh, my dad then met my mom, kept her in Canada. Well done, not sort of kidnapped, but you know, landed landed some love. And uh, when I was growing up, so there's a couple interesting messages there. When my dad was divorced, so good men could be divorced. Uh, people who are good can be divorced. People can learn from their divorce. That's an implicit message that I certainly saw. Um, my sister was raised as if my sister, I never even actually thought about the fact that she was from another marriage. Um, and so that like family doesn't have to be full blood or have to look the way we think it's supposed to look. My mother and father are still married today. They have uh, a great relationship. And so um, you can find happiness after divorce. That was another message that I received. Um, and my mom, when I was growing up, I have a brother too. Um, we would have families from all over the world at our house uh, for dinners and often, I think at least once a month. And I remember asking my mom, like, why was that important to you? And she said, well, as an immigrant, I found it really hard to integrate into the community. And so um, I really wanted to be able to contribute to that for other immigrants. And so that taught me like, wow, everyone's family, community is important. It's important to support one another. Uh, All ethnic, racial, all the backgrounds are important. Actually, they're not just important. They offer real amazing windows into culture and other ways of being. Um, One thing that we didn't really have growing up was a real understanding of my sister's childhood before us or like what her mom was like. And so I would say that 
there was sort of, this wasn't explicitly done, but I'd say because of that, um, my experience now as an adult is like, did my sister feel like there was space for her story as part of our family story? Um, and, and, you know, I don't think that it was done, um, you know, where we really talked about that or that was explicitly spoken of like, the story isn't just this perfect nuclear family. It was uh, this and there's some messy things here and that's actually okay. Um, and, you know, in my 20s, how it affected relationship. I mean, gosh, my, I really, I would say in my like teens, I really was a romantic, you know, I wanted love. I thought I'd be a great partner. I was really excited to be a good romantic partner. And um, I was really outgoing and, and, and I would say my father's really emotionally intelligent. So that was really helpful because, you know, I observed that like if I had pain or was going through a breakup, I often spoke to my dad about it, which I think for a lot of men, that's, that's not true. Um, my dad hugged me, my, you know, I have very fond memories of, of like my brother and I on both sides, my sister was nine years older. So my brother and I on like both sides of him, were only a year apart while he read us books, you know? Um, and, and so I, I think one, I often felt as a kid, as the youngest that I was, I tried to take responsibility for my mother's feelings. So if she was like upset, I really wanted to regulate her. And so I'd say there was a enmeshment that occurred there with, um, I really wanted to soothe her and maybe she came to me for soothing, um, yeah, because it was safer. Uh, but that really doesn't differentiate what ends up happening as a kid is you begin to want to please and you begin to want to oscillate around whoever person in the family that you might be like most reactive to, or they might be on, you know, for other people that might be like an alcoholic parent or someone who's really angered easily. I found that sometimes my mom would get really overwhelmed with us and she'd get quite reactive. And so I was really afraid of that. And so I think that really led into how I related um, you know, if you add to the fact that I grew up in the 80s and 90s, which is really when there was strong messaging, um, and that's certainly very true today, even more so, there was strong messaging that men are bad, men are rapists, men are murderers. Um, and so I remember wanting to be a nice guy, wanting to be different than how other men were. And, you know, there's sort of a righteousness to that, because what it does is it really abandons any form of what would have been like my masculinity or boundaries I didn't have boundaries because I often thought that boundaries meant I was controlling or not open to love or not pleasing. And so I'd say in my first couple of relationships, I should have laid down the hammer more than once. And I didn't, I laid down and I got fucking beautiful footprints on my forehead. And um, that really affected my relationships because one, my partners didn't, couldn't trust me because I couldn't say no to them. I couldn't stand up for my values. And, you know, I think in a lot of ways they had plenty of reason to that in a world where really uh, women have been taught to oscillate around the men for safety. Um, they couldn't get that even, even though they could maybe determine safety for themselves. Um, it was unsafe because I was creating this contract that if I'm nice, you'll love me. If I care for you, you'll love me. You won't leave me. You won't get upset. Um, and so that led to giant, whew, giant heartbreak in my early 20s. Uh, I was 20 uh, when that happened. And I would say what I did is I just went to the opposite. I became hyper more masculine. I was always into sports, so I always had that as an outlet. I played competitive sports. But I like became um, more of a womanizer. I sought security and just casual encounters. I never wanted a woman to see too deeply into me. I wouldn't allow them close because I didn't trust myself. I thought I would betray me. I would lose me. I didn't know that there's a space in between those two things. Like, um, you know, I use the archetypes of like this idea of this warrior and a child and a child loves with an open heart and will love anyone. It will get in a van with someone who candy. It's not a good thing all the time. Right. And a warrior is guarded. They'll protect, they'll chop hands off. They'll do, you know, they have, they're boundaried. But if they're, if you're hyper, uh, the child with no warrior, you're a doormat. 
you're not curating who you open your heart to. If you are a hyper warrior, you don't let anyone in your walls. Those aren't boundaries. And so I really went from doormat to warrior and I felt really unloved, really unseen. I entered a relationship in my early 20s with a woman that I went to college with who was, was and is a really incredible woman. And I just couldn't let her love me. I didn't know how. I was terrified of her. And, um, you know, that ultimately led to us getting engaged, me ending the engagement because, fuck, I didn't know what I was doing. I was so terrified of her. And um, that leading to this work because that really was what woke me up and made me go, okay, like at the time I wasn't like, I'm afraid of love and someone's going to love me. Uh, I was like, I don't get it. Like, I'm so good at talking about everything but my feelings. This doesn't make sense. And when my relationship ended, I felt very much like a failure. I felt like people weren't going to love me. I felt like I wasn't enough. Um, and, and so I started to study relationships and, that was just, um, I mean, it has been an amazing adventure because I started to discover like, even as good as I got at communicating or walking the talk, I realized that I also didn't let anyone love me for so long. It wasn't until I was like 35 that a woman said to me, have you ever actually let someone love you? And I was like, oh my God, no, not since I was 20, you know? And so I was in a five-year relationship and engaged, but I didn't even let her touch any parts of my, you know, very, very close. Anything I was in control of, anything I could handle the depth of. And when it, I, I couldn't commit to her long-term because I couldn't trust myself. You know, I didn't know how to open my heart and be safe. I didn't, I didn't have a warrior. I was afraid that if I let her in, I'd just be, I'd just lose me. And, and so um, it took the necessary journey. You know, I often get asked like, do you think you could have worked it out? If you had known all this stuff, then would you be together? It's like, it doesn't matter. None of it matters because it's not real. It's not true. It took all of those things to get me here today. And I often hear things like, oh man, I found your work. I wish I had found it three months ago, 10 years ago, five months. <clears throat> and I'm always like, you wouldn't have listened. <laughs> like, right. You know, you said at the very beginning, you know, uh, when, the, when the student's ready, the teacher arrives and, yeah. and, the, and the teacher changes and so does the student. You know, and, and you know, the, there's always a moment where people are done with my work or what I'm going through or what I relate to them and they move on to someone else. And I've been the same way. And, and you know, when I think about it, I remember asking Sherry Salata, who was the executive producer for Oprah and like president of the O Network. I remember asking her, like, you've been around all the greatest minds, like all the greatest spiritual teachers, like all of them. What is like the most profound thing about all of them or like, is there a commonality? And she said to me uh, that you don't need them. Yeah. And I was like, what? I know I've certainly needed like <laughs> Abraham Hicks or like, you know, perspective shift that you get from reading New yeah. Earth from Eckhart. Um, and she said, let me correct that. You need them to remind you that you don't. And I remember being like, oh. And so that's ultimately what everyone gets in the rock bottom is they find a teacher that relates to their alcoholism or their self-abandonment or whatever it is who says, you already knew all along. Here's just some reminders that this is what a boundary is or this is what how to get over heartbreak. Um, but the idea that a heartbreak can even take you down is because someone taught us that the, the break takes something with it. Um, and so you need to have your heart broken to, to break it open, yeah. you know, and you need to not have a boundary to learn that you need a boundary, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and so, yeah, shit, my childhood affected my adulthood. I remember the first time I talked to my friend Vienna, who's a marriage and family therapist. And I remember, you know, mindful MFT. And uh, she said to me, uh, your childhood definitely affects your relationships. And I was like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> And here I am today. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? Absolutely. How does, um, speaking on that, I mean, I've been, uh, I guess, uh, told that, you know, we're 
since our, I, I guess we parent, we parent ourselves as we were as a child. So I recognize like having that awareness now, like you said, like kind of reminding like, oh yeah, I do do that. <laughs> you know, right. how, how were you parented, I guess, like just re-explain that, I guess, as to how it showed up and, and does it still, or have you had awareness to how you can change? If yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, ideally. I mean, I think it's important for everyone to know that no matter what has occurred in your life, you can change. Uh, when sure. someone says, no, like, what about this? And I'm like, no. Like, I had Drew Canoli on my podcast who founded Organifi. Mm -hmm. He told the story of just, like, the horrible things he went through as a child. And this guy is, like, dialed. You know, he's like... He yeah. It's so, you know, and, and I didn't know that whole story. And I mean, he's proof and testament that you can. Yeah. You know, I, I would say that I grew up with, I didn't, you know, we didn't grow up. We grew up probably like poor when I was really young and then like lower middle class when I was in my teens. You know, when I was young, we had to choose between are, are you getting new shoes or are you getting soccer? You know, you know, like those choices had to be made. And, you know, but by all design, I had, parents who were available to me. I had, uh, as I said, a father who was really emotionally intelligent. I had, um, I had far more advantages than other people were offered. And, um, you know, when I think about how I was parented, you know, my, I think it's such a powerful shift to begin to see your parents as the children of parents. And the more I've learned about my parents' story, the more I understand why they parented me the way they did or where their limitations lied. And, and they're really open to those conversations, which again is a, a real privilege because that's not true for everybody. You know, I remember when I first started the work, my, my, you know, I didn't want to bring something up with them or clear something with them. And they'd be like, Oh God, you know, and, and, um, but now they're like, Oh, here's another thing Mark wants to talk about. And like, we'll do that. Uh, which again is such a blessing in, you know, I, I was parented with, my mom was quite strict. Um, I would say that she, I felt like when she would supervise when we were at school, because she sometimes did be the like parent volunteer. Mm -hmm. uh, I was embarrassed because she was like not lenient. She was uh, very disciplinary with other kids and I felt embarrassed by her. Um, my dad would probably got the easier role there because he was at work till five, you know, which again, lucky because I still saw him. And my mom was balancing us three being a, st uh, a step mom going to university still. She's a master of language. She speaks like seven languages. And, you know, I think I, that affected me in the perspective that, you know, I think I was critical on myself in, in, not allowing myself the grace of, of um, making mistakes, of uh, not being a great partner, of, uh, I'd say that, I'm not blaming it on it, but I'd say that just as a kid, when you get conditioned to, to not have boundaries, you don't have them as an adult, when you don't observe them, when, you know, and so have I changed it? Yeah, 100%, you know, I've, uh, I still get triggered like every human does. And I think a lot of the times people go, well, I've done the work, but I still get triggered. And I'm like, that's actually not what goes away. It's just what you do with the trigger that changes. And I think when we can see our triggers as actually being these like hyper brilliant paradigms or like um, pattern recognition tools, uh, we can start to see that there's so much value in them. It's just the reactivity that requires uh, the changing because I could feel like anxious because my there's no safety or something occurred and when I can begin to create space in my awareness of my wounds then I can say is this real is this valid is this uh, uh, as Dr. Salman she has a great line actually where she says is this my trauma or my truth mm. and I love that line because it really oh it's like oh like there's space for both like it doesn't make trauma wrong it just makes it makes it something that we can learn and observe and, and, and build compassion and empathy for. And I'm just by asking the question, I'm saying both of you belong, uh, but I'm not going to let trauma choose for me, um, which again is a learned thing. I, you know, I don't want to say like, that's what you do. You just ask that question and life's fucking <laughs> beautiful. 
Um, okay. No, you're going to get it wrong and you're going to get it right. And you're going to get it wrong a couple of times. And that's what growth is. You know, it's as they say in AA, it's about progress, not perfection. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And speaking of that, I mean, just like learning the lesson, I, um, you know, for me, my personal story, obviously, like I said, I was not my boundaries. So it's like, it was as if like God kept testing me. Well, maybe she'll learn this time. Maybe she'll learn this time. Right. all the guys. And, you know, my, my thing for the last relationship that I, I went through was a guy that I was friends with for 25 years. And, you know, that hit me so much harder because I was like, well, shit, like, I'm sure that, you know, I'm sure we'll have a, like, we didn't leave on bad blood, but we both had to like, be like, we're going to keep doing the same song and dance if we don't just cut ties and go our separate ways for a while or ever or whatever. But um, that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. I was like, the pain of losing a friend was so much worse than like, like I've learned my lesson. I'm going to be in my boundaries. If they're not (laughs) up to par, then whatever. (laughs) Can't keep like trying to hold on to something that's not, you know, that's not working. Mm. So that was my thing. But I mean, how do you speak to that to other, you know, the listeners here is like, you just keep learning your lesson or is there something like a, a, a strategy to give them to <laughs> be like, okay, well, how do I learn it faster? <laughs> so I don't keep attracting the same experiences or men. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, you grow from them. That's the, I think the limiting, like an exercise that I have people do is write down everything in their life that's hurt you right? Every single event. And, and so create that all in the left column and then put a line and draw two more columns. And in the column beside that one, beside each event, you write out, what is the belief I created about myself because of that event? Mm -hmm. So, and, and what people will start to see is the constructs of their unconscious mind and their identity. So like if you're tolerating toxic behavior, if you're attracted to unavailable people, if you keep attracting narcissists, that's a common one I hear, um, you have to start to look out what in your identity validates that that should be in your environment. Mm-hmm. Because it has to. Your, your belief, if it's I'm worthy of love and respect, if you accept anything less than that from yourself and from other people, your belief either has to shift or your life does. And most people are used to accommodating their environment by changing their internal landscape, their internal architecture. Mm -hmm. And so when you write down, what is the belief I created about myself, about each one of these events, traumas, whatever they might be, and they're as significant as they are to you. You know, we often have sort of a hierarchy of like, my pain's not valid because, um, someone's six out of 10 is another person's two out of 10 and someone's one out of 10 is someone else's 10 out of 10. Uh, no one needs to validate it but you. And so by putting it on the sheet, you validate it. You know, like my first relationship was in grade nine and it was with a girl for a week. To someone else, that's like, a oh, week. come on, Mark. Devastating. Are yeah. you kidding me? I listened to End of the Road from Boys to Men. Oh. Uh, if fucking Adele was available then, I don't know if I'd be here. You know, <laughs> shit was, that's a whole another level of, of music. Um, I joke, but you know, I, I, I say that with empathy too, cause that was, it's fucking hard, yeah. you know, and, and beside the column of what was the belief you created about yourself, the next one is, um, what is the wisdom in the experience? How would I be exa- asked to expand because of what I heard? So essentially you're looking for what is the tool I didn't have or need now yeah. to not experience that again? Cause of course, if you're a kid and you experience abuse. Um, you don't have the tool and you shouldn't have had the tool, you know, like that's not our fault, but if we think we should have had the tool, it goes into blame mode. So, which is normally how we process those things. Um, Instead of saying, what tool would I need today as an adult to not experience that again? And so we write in the, the event, the belief, the wis, the, the tool, the wisdom. And then what you do is you tear the paper you fold over where the wisdom lies you tear the half with the the belief and the events and you burn it or you do whatever you want to do to get rid of it but you actually have a a ceremony where you sit down very intentionally you could do it with your friends they don't have to read your list 
Right. But you just do it with your friends and, and you have it like, you can call it your bullshit burning ceremony, your belief burning ceremony. The other thing you could do actually to add to the wisdom is the belief you want to hold about yourself because of the event, the belief that should be, and you can add that as another column. Because what you're doing is you're really saying like, I'm going to take responsibility for what I make these events mean. And, you know, this is validated in the research that that what happens in your life when you tell the story of your life, what happens is less important than how you tell the story of what happened. And this correlates to like, let's look at, uh, for example, like Brene Brown, when she talks about the difference between oversharing and vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So she says the, the real question to ask is, has this person earned the right to my story? And I was thinking about that and I was like, yeah, but there's like an energetic to oversharing, especially like early in a relationship, right? Like on a first couple of dates, this person hasn't earned the right to your greatest trauma, to your whatever it is. And people know if they're oversharers because they'll say, well, yeah, of course the person didn't earn the right. It was like just after I swept right on Tinder, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, but there's something about it that like, if, if I need you to validate this thing about me, that I think is unworthy. So I'm going to share it so that you can invalidate it likely because one, I'm violating your boundary because you haven't actually even earned the right to hear this thing. And I'm now saying, hold this thing. I don't know how to hold. Mm -hmm. And so the other person goes, well, fuck, I can't hold that. Like that's yours. And it comes with an energetic that the other person can't even hold it anyway. So here I am putting it upon you. And uh, it continues this validate the story of I'm too much. This no one can love my story. But really what's being invited is can I hold it so that I don't even need to actually put it in your hands till you've earned the right to see that part of me. But I don't hide it in a box. It's a box that actually has a key that only people who have earned the right get it access to. I still hold the key. I open the box. I choose when. And what I noticed is there's this mass, I was sort of exploring my own energetics when I would share versus not or whatever. And I realized that the huge difference is that vulnerability um, versus oversharing is that oversharing shares an event uh, and it shares the pain of it. Mm -hmm. Vulnerability shares the wisdom. Vulnerability doesn't, it says, oh man, this, like when you ask someone like, oh, why did your last relationship end? If they haven't processed it, they're still going to dump bullshit. You know, they're still going to dump pain. They're still going to dump that person was a fucking asshole, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't mean they weren't an asshole, but remember how everyone talks about their ex could be you one day. So it's important to explore. Um, But I always look for someone who doesn't have a charge about their ex anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, which is not to say you can't have like a charge about the betrayal, but that they're not still stuck in it. And um, I think the important thing is to look at, like I could share the wisdom I garnered from a relationship ending. Like, you know what? They, there was some betrayal there and da, 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 da. And it was a real painful ending. What I learned from it is. And so now it's, it's vulnerability and it's connective, but I'm not asking you to hold anything. I don't know how to hold. So it's a totally different energy. I, I hope that makes sense. And I know that was like a long answer to a really earlier question. <laughs> no, but that was perfect. I needed that too. <laughs> no, absolutely. I I was like, yeah, that defines me. I'm the vulnerable one. <laughs> so, yeah. um, do you think, is just speaking on vulnerability, um, and I'm just using personal experience because that's all I know. Um, but so if in my situation, where my partner was not able to, he didn't, he couldn't be like, I'm a very vulnerable person. I'm very vulnerable. And maybe I overshare some too, but he always was like, I know you're trying, I know you want me to be more vulnerable. I know you want me to be more open with you. Like he he was very aware that he had some darknesses quote unquote, or, or whatever that he was maybe afraid to explore. So it was harder for him to be as vulnerable. Um, do you feel that he was not being vulnerable because he didn't feel safe or because he really did not want to explore that? Or could it be both? 
Mm. I mean, it could be so many things. Uh, you know, I, the way that we handle relational trauma, relational pain is we are often either become, as I mentioned, sort of like the child or the warrior, we often become too open mm-hmm. <clears throat> or we become too closed. Yeah. And so really what happens is, is um, I don't know how to relate to the space between you and I. So if you want space, I try to chase you. And because you need space, which sounds more like him, um, you, when you come too close, I want to run. Mm-hmm. So like one person needs no space for safety and the other one needs space for safety. And it's really learning, especially, you know, because most people who are the chaser, um, social media sort of rewards that, you know, because it says you're just the one that loves more, the one that cares more, the one that I just want to love all out. And I'm not speaking to you specifically. I'm speaking to former versions of myself. I just want to be <laughs> open hearted and I'm here and I'm available Um, is actually to reel that back in because there is a righteousness to that and there's a safety that's created from that. But it's it's the unwillingness to hold our own stories, the unwillingness to hold our own energy. You know, Mm -hmm. when I first started dating Kai, she was definitely more avoidant. I would say I was actually pretty secure when we started dating. Um, But her avoidance Uh, What I realized is she could never step towards me if I didn't create space for her to step into. Yeah. And so um, with your, with your former partner, you know, it, it could be that there was a fear of being criticized. If you shared that thing, it could be that um, he didn't get to know the thing himself, you know, which I really think is more what it is. It's like, it's beautiful if my partner wants to inquire as to my patterns or my pain or what I'm going through, but then it's my responsibility to process that in my men's group or with a therapist or reading a book or um, even just like doing meditation, like forms. Literally, if you have the internet, you can find anything that could help resolve or look into just a nudge of the feeling. Like, you know, if you're trying to heal nervous system stuff, which I think most people are actually trying to heal and it shows up as relationship stuff, uh, is you have to get to know meditation and breath work. And uh, it's great to work with a somatic therapist, you know? Um, And so like, it's the invitation can come from you. Mm -hmm. Uh, But accepting the invitation and taking the step towards what would allow me to get to know that thing, that darkness, as you, as you called it. And I think that's a great term of like the shadow parts of ourselves that, you know, it's kind of like if couples don't talk about what's actually going on in their relationship, it gets talked about anyway. So it just shows up in uh, absenteeism. It shows up in, which sounds like some sort of workplace thing. It shows up in like not showing up. It shows up in delayed text responses. It shows up in, um, turning away instead of turning towards. It yeah. shows up in ignoring bids. It shows up in not giving bids. It shows up in intimacy. It shows up in all these places. And I think the same is true about all the things that we struggle with. We hit our upper limits in relationship because of our own, our own challenges. And, you know, like my relationship doesn't have as many tricks as I have tools. You know, um, my traumas don't have as many tricks as I have tools now. And um, I say that again, I probably hit a fucking limit just because I said that. Um, (laughs) But I'm still willing to go find the tool. Right. Like if I, which I've certainly hit an edge of something. And then I'm like, oh, I don't know how to walk through this. I got to learn how to walk through this. And as a form of vulnerability and connection, I'm going to ask my partner if they know how to walk through this. Or do they see a light in a path that I don't see? Mm-hmm. But I still got to walk it. And if they try to walk it for me, it creates codependency. Because yeah. then she's over-functioning, trying to fix me. And I'm now being, it's co- sending the message to me that they can't trust me to hold my own thing too. Um, and so over-functioning, really what it does is it takes away the belief in someone else that they can navigate something on their own. Right. Which is probably what they were taught all along, not to trust themselves, that they don't know what they're doing. And so, you know, a lot of people get 
uh, committed to or addicted to, addicted is the wrong word, committed to or stuck in the identity that their values in fixing and the other ones get stuck in the, in the identity that they're broken. Yeah. And so they need someone to fix them as opposed to they do not. And then, you know, it sort of comes back to what Sherry said, that, that the teacher just reminds you that your value doesn't live in that thing and your lack of value doesn't, uh, will not be fixed by someone else. You got to go into it. You yes. got to go into the darkness. Yeah. yeah. What will you find? You'll just find yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, granted, I came to this place, but um, for me, you know, I, again, we had a par last partner and I, we had to go our separate ways, but you know, there's still that I would be honest and say that there's still these parts of me that I'm like, gosh, you know, I want to be like, so like, if, if, if there's almost like still some of that fixing energy, like within me, like, I'm like, God, I just, I just want to like help him to like work through this still, <laughs> you right. know? And, but then, I, but then I bring the awareness to myself. I'm like, okay, well, Kelly, are you, is like, why do you want to do that? And then I take myself and I even coach my, my, you know, my clients on this. I'm like, okay, when you feel like you need to like go into that fixer mode or project externally or something, go back within yourself, ask yourself, what have you not done today? Whether that's go like color in a coloring book, go do some breath work meditation and tap into your self love because that is the thing that needs the fixing is yourself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just speaking to that, I guess, is that a constant, well, two part question. Is that like a, just a, a deep rooted thing of me because I've been this fixer for so long that I just like feel like I have to fix everything all the time. <laughs> you <laughs> you know? got a good job for it. Yeah, I, I know exactly. Um, but in the second part is like how, you know, how they always say, you know, when you, when a relationship ends, like it's hard to, you know, um, get over your past, get over your partner until you meet someone else. And then, that kind of like gets over it. But what if, I mean, let's put it this way. We're in a pandemic. Like, yeah, it's maybe not as easy for people to like go out and meet people and that kind of thing. So I, I know that I have pined for back of, for lack of a better word over my ex partner. Um, and I'm sure that there are other women out there or men too, that have also been experiencing that because they haven't met that other person. So how, I mean, is my advice like tune into the self? Is that the best thing we can do right now <laughs> like, to get over the X? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I want to acknowledge that like when we go into healing work, we're usually someone who gets value from doing it. You know, yeah. like same with me. Uh, it's just, is my value rest in their outcomes or their choices or whatever it is? And, and that's something that we learn to differentiate. And that's part of healing codependency beyond just a relational dynamic it becomes sort of more of a collective dynamic you know i think a lot of us were taught to hustle for love and so sometimes that can be translated into our work and you know i would argue that the majority of healthcare providers coaches therapists um, are all likely in some way people who do that and i don't even need the science to support that i know that's true and if there's science that supports that awesome um you know, I usually, whenever I teach boundaries in a workplace, uh, oh my gosh, in a healthcare setting or a setting where a culture is based on being first in and first out, like there's such a culture and a, it's like normal to self-abandon to, uh, to be there. And mm. I think mm. what you're speaking to of like wanting your partner to get better or change, or even this uh, idea that you're sort of longing to still is there a possibility that this person could do that thing? I think just an important question to check in is like, is the desire to give my partner a book or happen to have a podcast on in the car when we get in it? Um, is that, I know all the tricks. Uh, <laughs> is that coming from a place of security and truth? Um, or is it actually self-abandonment? Am I doing the work for them or am I inviting them to do the work and inviting them to show up. And then also, uh, and I remember talking to the Gottmans about this because I, I did a book club with them on the book, Eight Dates, which is a fantastic book for all couples to explore. It's eight essential conversations all healthy relationships have to explore. Mm. And I remember I said, well, if someone, someone asked a question, like if my partner doesn't want to read the book, 
is that a red flag? And I was asking the question for someone and I was like, yeah, it's a red flag. And Julie, I remember she was like, no, 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 Mark. Like you have to explore why, because they're allowed to choose whether they want to read a book or not. Maybe the book isn't the avenue to their growth. You know, ask them to participate in the choice. You know, just because someone doesn't want to go to therapy doesn't mean it's a red flag. It, it just means to get curious. Yeah. And, and like, what is it for you that we're afraid of or you're afraid of? Um, and, and what are some alternatives that we can explore? Now, if there's like, I don't want to explore any, that's a red flag. You know, that's saying, I don't want to do this work. And that could be because they're afraid, but still they're afraid and they're not doing anything about it. So do you want to be in a relationship with someone who's not doing anything about it? Because the people who keep extending invitations and never getting those invitations answered, uh, the pattern changes to stop sending invitations and staying. It's to like give consequences to not accepting them. And that in and of itself is an act of reclamation and pattern changing for the people who like writing invitations. Mm. And, you know, I, I think it's important to recognize the human biological experience of missing someone and not invalidating that and, and wanting for someone to change. I certainly still would like for my partners when I was 19 to change. And, you know, in some way, I think that would, that longing would validate maybe and maybe heal my, my uh, pain that still is very human. That's that knows I could tell the story of one of them and still experience tears. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's good. That I don't see that as a, an error in my healing. It's oh. just that I have integrated fully what I've learned in that moment. And it allows me to sit in the compassionate space of 19 year old Mark and what he actually felt in that moment and the actual pain and the suffering and just wishing someone would see it. Just wishing I would have seen it. And I would have taken the time to process it. And so I think when we can, you know, recognize the complete complexities of, of what it means to be human, that I can think about a memory that's 23 years old and still cry. And that there are so many multitudes to us and so much complexity to us that, that we're in a pandemic or you know, the, 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 this experience and dating looks different and relating looks different and the world looks different. And we're, there's constant fear porn on the news. And there's, you know, it's it, 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 to not just actually create space within myself for the experience of how complex that is and how scary that is. And also, like, am I allowing my fears, my fear of hurt, my fear of suffering, my fear of heartbreak, um, my fear of death? Am I allowing all of those things to actually decide my life? So if I'm afraid of getting hurt because I haven't processed or explored a heartbreak, then I'm still letting the heartbreak rule my life. If I'm afraid to move forward because it might mean coming to completion with that thing or I have to let go of the resentment to my ex, like, fuck you for breaking up with me or hurting me or betraying me or not doing the work. Look at what you've done to me. And now I can't move forward. Oh, what a load of righteous bullshit. Because yeah. what it says is you're going to be a prisoner and suffer for the rest of your life to prove to them how much they hurt you. They're yeah. chilling, probably not even thinking about it, especially if you dated a narcissist, they could give a fuck that yeah. you're like posting on Instagram, quoting lyrics from Taylor Swift. <laughs> and I did that one. So that's why I was a call out on myself is they don't give a fuck because, and maybe they do give a shit, but it doesn't matter because like, what are we proving by not allowing our hearts to open again? You know, I've said this more recently of like a, a broken heart is, is one that won't open, mm -hmm. you know, a broken heart when you're feeling the pain of the heartbreak or just even going back to a situation that was painful. You're just reminding yourself that you're open, but like, can you get in touch with the part that needed to curate the openness? You know, cause most of us close our hearts cause we don't have a warrior. Yeah. We just have a child. And so the child closes their heart, hides in a corner 
hides in their room, hides in the closet, hides under the bed. And, you know, I've been thinking more about this recently. How do you, how do you get out from there? How do you stand, you know, knowing that the world is going to bring at you so much, but it's not going to change me. It's not going to, you know, like heartbreak to me is just evidence that I care, that I love, Mm -hmm. but I'm also know that if my partner left me tomorrow, today, I would still be okay because I know that it is through a partner leaving me where I wasn't okay that I recognize like, what did I give her that she could take my, my well-being with her, which is separate from experiencing the grief of losing someone. You know, like one day when my parents pass, um, I know that that is going to be a devastating experience. And I know that I'm blessed that that hasn't happened. So many people have lost parents, family, friends, especially in the last bit. Um, but like, how do I create space in my experience that, that it just demonstrates how much I loved them. And for me, that's actually where, you know, this idea of going into the darkness or going into grief or going into sadness is actually where we got to go. Because that's where, you know, Francis Weller, who I love as a teacher, he says that the soul dwells in the darkness, that it likes to keep us on the edges of death. And, and you know, not just mortal death, but like just the death of identities, the death of expectations, mm-hmm. but not the death of hope, which I think is a very different thing. When you okay. give hope away because of loss, um, you sort of lose the light that, that is leading you out. Um, and I think when you know, when, when you know that grief is a gateway, then, um, you know, that even though you're moving through it slowly, like molasses, maybe sometimes I have certainly experienced that, like, has anything changed from yesterday to today? Um, but when you look back over time, you see that, yeah, so as long as you're just keeping an eye and you're, you're sitting in it, you're exploring it, maybe you're drawing, you're writing about it, you're reading about it but you're seeing that um, there's so much to learn in it. Um, And I think because we live in a culture that is very much like stay positive, go to the light, light worker, light being, um, everything, you know, you think about the structure of all movies are very much like the hero's uh, journey from uh, Joseph Campbell. You know, it's, it's this idea that we're heroic or that we're, that we can't show any sort of weakness. And that's this idea that weakness is something that's not good or even what we code as weakness is where I would say, oh my gosh, when someone says they're sad to me, I'm like, I would imagine that you have every reason to be sad. Right. So like when, when we can't touch those feelings, which are informing us always, we try to seek how to fix ourselves or change ourselves to accommodate our circumstances or our environment. And I would say, actually, how do you explore yourself so that you can change your environment, not learn to compensate for it or to find what's wrong with you? But if you don't feel broken in a broken world, I'd say there's something fucked up. If, if you don't feel like you're sad in, 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 in a search of circumstance or a situation that is inherently sad, I'd say there's a problem. Yeah. So when someone says, I'm feeling all these things, I'm like, wow, that's evidence that you work. It's evidence that you're wise. That's evidence uh, that you're human. And, you know, I think this is, we're in a special time because I don't know that we've been able to have these conversations on the scale that we are now. Yeah, absolutely. I know. Cause I mean, you either were forced to communicate or you were forced to hide. Right. You know, right. and even, even your communication might be um, only be assertive or aggressive. And so no one was gentle, Yeah. you know? And so you hide, right? Like the other person hides. Mm-hmm. And so you continue the cycle till we learn how to meet somewhere in, in the openness. And that's where there's this integration because you think of like, if you can alchemize the warrior and the child, you have an adult. Yeah. You know, and that's, and that's where two adults relating, they have space for complexity and wounds and sadness and growth and feedback and inadequacy and, you know, Absolutely. Yeah. And it's all about communication. I mean, 
At the end of the day, right? All about communication. (laughs) And anyone can learn that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, my communication has radically improved. Um, I mean, obviously, just from my own experience of personal development journey, but, you know, even more from going on Love is Blind. I mean, that was a pretty forced scenario. um, I couldn't imagine having gone on that. That shit's fucked. I would never. (laughs) Like when people go on The Bachelor, I'm like. Totally. Of course you're anxious and going crazy. You're vying for someone's love who has 24 other people. Yeah. I couldn't even, crazy. Yeah, absolutely. I know I, I had a conversation with a former Bachelor contestant and he, he was like, you know, I thought you guys' show was, was pretty crazy. He goes, but I really think the Bachelor Bachelorette is even more crazy than, although you guys, yeah, go through the whole marriage thing or whatever. He goes, but it's like, it's literally like one person and 20 other people vying for like one person. <laughs> I was like, yeah, then, I mean, I couldn't even imagine. And fame, right? Like, really, yeah. you know, so many of them are vying for fame, which I get it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's human. You know, it's entertainment. And then you hear about how much um, you're sort of at the whim of the editors. Mm-hmm. You know, how they're going to make you look, what that's going to, and that's not in your hands. Their job is to create different archetypes, villains, um, the sweethearts, the whatever it is, the gentleman, the, the asshole, you know, the jock or whatever it is. And um, we remove the humanness of all those people when we put them in boxes like that, which is ultimately what editing can do. It doesn't always do that. Right, but it does. (laughs) But yeah, try saying that to anyone who's been on one of those shows who, who wasn't villainized. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I mean, like for, for me on the experience, granted, I wasn't villainized to the extent of some of my other castmates, but just the way that the show wound up and certain ideologies, assumptions that how I was made through editing. I mean, yeah, I, I also was a villain. I mean, some people some, <laughs> some a lot, <laughs> aka a lot of people did project on me, you know, like, yeah. you're gonna die alone, like, you'll be single forever. Like, how could you like break his heart like that? No wonder, you know, we're I- all just afraid of these things <laughs> happening to us. So we go villainize some yeah. character on a show who's a human and we forget. Totally. Well, think about how much we've forgotten the humanness of people we celebritize. Look at what's happened to Britney Spears, you know, oh, no matter yeah. where you sit on that, I mean, you can't look at her Instagram and not be like, wow, like someone, someone help this person, you yeah. know, mm-hmm. and man, to be a celebrity in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s too, where there weren't as many laws protecting them. I think it's crazy even now that if some paparazzi takes your picture and you post it on your Instagram, you can get sued for violating the copyright of a picture of you. That's fucking crazy. Really? Right? I, don't, I didn't know that. Yeah. I forget oh. what magazine or whatever sued. I think it's, uh, I forget which uh, model, but someone and they're, and they're like sued them for violating a copyright of sharing their work. Wow. A picture of them. Like how fucking crazy is that? That is nuts. That is so crazy. <laughs> That is crazy. Oh my gosh. Well, um, I guess just uh, any like last words. I mean, I could talk to you forever. I have so many, so many topics, <laughs> but any last words, any like just maybe your favorite piece of advice. I don't know for anybody. <laughs> what are you feeling? I, cool? What's channeling through you right now? Mark? <laughs> uh, well, first off, thanks so much for having me. It's always such a pleasure to chat with you and, and to, be both a part of and witness your journey has been really beautiful and inspiring. And, you know, I think for anyone listening, if you identify with anything, um, I think it's just to always be compassionate to yourself and like take the time and find the space to give yourself grace as you learn, as you unfold, as you make mistakes, you know, and, and as you learn new things, you look at your life through the eyes of someone who knows that thing now, but you didn't always know that thing. Mm -hmm. And so you got to give compassion for the years up until the moment you learn that thing, you have to give compassion for not knowing it. And I, you know, that was probably some of the hardest work I ever had to do was recognizing and not, and not villainizing or exiling the younger versions of me that uh, I didn't welcome home. And, you know, that's the work is like, how do I, take everything I've been through and get to this moment and find some way 
to integrate it and be compassionate for it and shit that's hard work and and that's why not everyone does it that's why people get wasted and you know disconnect from themselves and not to you know shame anyone who likes getting wasted that's cool if you want to Um, and personal growth is cool too so yeah right i've done both i was the one who got who disconnected and shit i loved it (laughs) it me i loved a good uh night out and and i think you can find balance doing that so i don't want to shame that i think it's when we're reaching for those things to not sit when we reach for anything it can be food it can be sex it could be drugs it could be alcohol um it can be your phone yeah yeah and so it's why do we do it and what's beneath it those are the questions to ask and and what will i find if i go in there that i can't hold you can hold anything that's yours that's why it's yours yeah, absolutely. I love that. Thank you. Well, where can everybody find you? Uh, you can find me on Create the Love uh, on a lot of platforms, just not like TikTok because I don't have the dance moves for that. <laughs> and um, you can find the boundaries course that Kelly's talking about at INeedBoundaries.com. Um, and you can find all my courses on CreateTheLove.com because I got one for healing codependency, one for... Um, rediscovering who you are and like really getting back in touch with or discovering who you are. If you're not really sure it goes through like finding your values and what matters to you. And um, it's a program that's all about uh, really giving birth to your totality. And um, yeah, I mean, thank you. I really appreciate being on here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again for for coming and being a part of it. (laughs) Thank Thank you. you. You're welcome. Thanks so much. Okay.